Hey, welcome back to Computer Science Theory. This is comms W3261, offered summer B 2021 at Columbia University. And this is lecture 11, part two, time complexity. So this is the last lecture for this course. And the focus of this course is more on computability than time complexity. I do think, however, that it's important to give you an idea of where this stuff we're doing might go, it might take you later, both in algorithms and in complexity classes. So we're gonna do that. Um, that said, if this stuff appears on the final, it'll likely be as extra credit. So, you know, sit back, relax, enjoy the ride. There are some really cool concepts yet to be discovered. So let's see, recall from your intro to computer science class, this idea of asymptotic analysis, can't spell analysis, which is two scary words for roughly comparing functions. The motivation behind this is pretty simple. Uh, we wanna have some way of comparing how fast or how efficiently our programs run, but we don't wanna get caught up in little details. Like if program one takes three N plus six steps and program number two takes two N plus 100 steps. Well, for small values of N, it's not clear which one is faster, but once you get to really big values of N, like the ones you need to use a computer to solve that you can't do by hand, these constants aren't gonna matter so much. What's really gonna matter is that three n is bigger than two n. Um, similarly, you know, n squared is gonna be bigger than 10 n once you get big enough n's. So that's the sort of, the motivation behind asymptotic analysis is we just want to roughly compare functions. We want to do something a little simpler than tracking every single step. So to that end, we use these, these notations of big O and big omega. So we'll say, let f and g be some functions f and g that map the natural numbers to positive real numbers. And in this case, we'll imagine F and G, um, they track the time it takes to run on certain input. If I put in an input of size 100, F will tell me how much time it takes to run, some program to run on that input. G will tell me the same thing. We'd like to compare which one is bigger. So we'll say for one of our definition, Fn is O of G of N if there exists positive integers and O and C such that Fn is smaller than C times Gn for all n greater than or equal to N O. So we've introduced two constants and we've used them to make a precise statement of, what, of something that's really pretty general. I mean, I don't advise that you do this, but if you've never seen asymptotic notation before, you could probably get through this whole lecture just thinking of big O of G N this way. Um, Fn is O of G N basically means that in the long run, F is at most some constant times G.
And if you want to get even sloppier, you might say, in the long run, F is, oh man, I'm really hesitant to write this. F is smaller than G. It's not really smaller because we have this wiggle room, right? We're saying for big enough inputs, N greater than or equal to N zero, there's some constant by which we can scale G so that G is bigger than F. Um, but morally, we kind of use it to say, F is no bigger than G. That's what Fn equals big O of Gn means. Um, similarly, we have another function, which is just kind of the opposite. So we've got big O of G and big omega of G. So we say Fn is big omega of Gn if there exist positive integers and zero and C such that Fn is bigger than CGN for all n greater than or equal to n zero. So this is just the complementary statement. It's saying that Fn is big omega of GN if you can scale GN usually down by some small value and then say for all integers, um, n bigger than n zero, bigger than this threshold, fn's bigger. So again, you could sort of say fn equals big omega of gn. What you're sort of saying is in the long run, um, f is no smaller than g, or not much smaller than g. these tildes again, because you know technically f can be a little smaller than g, but it can only be smaller by a constant factor. So these will be our two tools for comparing functions in this section. And it'll save us a lot of work, even though it seems complicated. We can say things like, uh, well, any function that's got n squared in it is bigger in the sense of big omega than any function that's only got n in it, a linear term because when you square numbers, eventually they get bigger than any linear function. That's kind of how we we'll use this. So I'll write down some quick examples to refresh your brain. But again, I am assuming that you've seen something like this in an earlier CS class. If not, this is Sipser section 7.1. So the number 10 big O of log two of n, 10 is some constant. So it's certainly true that 10 is smaller than some constant times log of n because log of n gets bigger with n. Uh, log of n in turn is smaller than a linear function of n. So, you know, certainly once n is big enough, this linear function n is going to be bigger than its log. Um, we can also say things like um, n, this linear function, is big o or big omega of log 2n. And that's just saying the same thing as the previous statement. Uh, it's saying that for large enough numbers, n is bigger or at least proportionally scaled. Um, it's the same as log 2n. Um, 5n is both big O of n and big o omega of n. I'll write that without the parentheses so it's less weird. The reason 5n is big O of n, yes, 5n is bigger than n. But there's some constant c that we can pick, like 10, such that for big enough n, 5n is less than 10n. That's our kind of wiggle room here is this constant scaling. Often we'll use big O and big omega notation to chop off extra terms that we don't need. So if we say like 16n squared 
plus n plus four. Well, that's O of n squared. And the reason we know this is because I can take some constant, multiply it by n squared. Say I'll pick something bigger than 16, like 17. So 17 n squared will eventually be bigger than 16 n squared plus n plus four, just because that extra n squared that I've added on top dominates n plus four for large enough numbers. Also, occasionally we'll use this notation for exponential functions. So, you know, two to the n is a lot smaller than three to the n. Um, and, you know, this can get very complicated very quickly if you're trying to work out functions that are complicated with respect to each other, but we won't actually be using it very much in this lecture. We'll just be using it in the most general sense to gesture toward classes of functions that are bigger and smaller than each other. So, you know, you can do math, log base two of three to the n using the rules of logs, that's n times log base two of three, which is big O of n, because this is just a constant times n. Um, again, if this stuff is a little, um, a little rusty for you, I would recommend going through these examples, thinking about it a little bit, because this is very useful in the future and getting comfortable with it will help you uh, talk about functions informally and compare them easily, but it's not strictly, strictly necessary to be super on top of this for our, our fun exploration that we'll be doing for the next little while. So now that we've got big O notation, we can use it to talk about time complexity and we can use it to group together functions that have similar running times. So let's write down a definition for time complexity. So let's let M be a deterministic single tape turning machine that halts on all inputs. So that means M is a decider. We say the running time or the time complexity is the same thing of M is a function mapping natural numbers to natural numbers that indicates the maximum number of steps that M takes to halt on any input of length n. So why is it a function? Why is it not just some number? The thing we want to allow for here is the idea that the bigger the input, the longer the program takes to run. So if I have a program that adds two numbers together, or if I have a program that sorts a list of numbers, or if I have a program that looks at a graph and determines some property, intuitively, that program is gonna get slower if I put in bigger inputs, right? Wanna add two things together, it's always gonna be harder to add two big things together than two small things together. So what we'll do is we'll tie the runtime to the size of the input. We'll say something like, if you put in two, n bit integers to my adding program, I'll define the runtime in terms of n. Given any two n bit integers, what's the worst case? What's the highest number of steps it takes me to add them together? So running time will go up with input size, but we'll be talking about the rate at which it goes up. Now that we have this definition, we can also use it to define um, classes of languages. So the next natural definition that we come up with is we define the complexity class time Tn to be 
a set of all languages decided by some TM that runs in time O of TN. So complexity class here is a phrase we'll start using a lot. This just means set of languages. We call it a complexity class because intuitively it's a set that is equally hard, equally difficult for computers. So for instance, if I say I'm interested in the complexity class time n, well, that's all the languages that a Turing machine can decide in time big O of n. It's kind of like all the concepts I can recognize in linear time in n steps or in three n steps or 10 n steps or 10 n plus two steps. We'll group all those things together because often they tend to have similar characteristics. So let's do a quick example of what this might look like on a particular algorithm. So let's look at TMs that decide the language A equals zero to the K, one to the K, or some K greater than or equal to zero. So you might remember this as a language that was not regular, but is context-free. And it's pretty easy for a Turing machine to decide. But the thing is, it's easy in terms of computability. We've certainly said some Turing machine can decide this language, but there's an open question of how quickly can a Turing machine do it? So here's one approach. So we'll consider some machine M1 to decide this language. And M1 will do the following. On input W, of length n, scan and reject if any zero occurs to the right of a one. So this is just a check to make sure if my input is reasonably formatted and I can reject if it fails this check. And then if it succeeds this check, then I don't have any zeros to the right of ones. I might have an empty string, but I certainly have some string in zero star, one star. So I will shuttle back and forth crossing off zeros and ones and accept if and only if there are same number of O's and ones. So this is a Turing machine. It decides the language. And now we can look at it and say, okay, what's the running time of this Turing machine? So we can break it up by steps. We can say, okay, this takes, Step one, well, we need to scan from left to right. So we'll certainly need to move left um, n times to get to the end of the string. And apart from that, our procedure should be pretty simple. We start in some state that's looking for a one. If we see a one, then we start looking for a zero. We reject if we see any zero to the right of a one. So we'll say this takes on the order of n steps, depending on how you implement it. Um, we'll hand wave a little bit what we'll say. Essentially, it's a scan from left to right. Maybe I have a few extra, like some constant number of extra steps. Maybe I even take two n steps. Um, but we'll say it takes about n steps. Now, shuttling. Well, we scan the tape once 
for every input. So it takes about time n to scan. And there are about n inputs. Sorry, not in, one input string, but there are n input symbols by definition. And I claim that this is my worst case because if there's not the same number of zeros and ones, I'll terminate early, right? I'll, um, if there's less zeros than ones, I'll terminate and reject if there's fewer zeros. If there's less ones than zeros, then I'll terminate and reject when I cross off my last one. So the total time complexity well, it'll look like you know a times n for step one plus b times n squared for step two, you know, maybe plus some constant c. But I can look at this whole expression and say, well, eventually the n squared part of it is going to be the biggest part for sufficiently large n. So this whole thing is O n squared. And that's where my big O notation comes in handy. I don't have to worry about these specific linear scaling and constants. I've got what I would normally call an O n squared algorithm to decide this language. I'll show you one more approach that's a little bit better on a slightly different Turing machine. Just to keep getting our feet under us. Second approach. On a two tape TM. And notice that um, time complexity generally, um, well, I've defined it for a deterministic single tape TM. This will be a two tape TM. So it'll have an analogous time complexity definition. Uh, the reason I've specified deterministic and single tape here is because even though they don't change what's computable, we proved that non-determinism and multi-tape TMs can compute the same functions, they can decide the same languages, um, they do affect the running time. So now my superpowers are coming in handy. So let's look at an approach to solve this problem with a two-tape Turing machine. On input W, well, one, we'll scan for formatting, same as before. So we'll go left to right, we'll check to see if there's any zero occurring to the right of a one and we'll reject if that happens. But now we can do something a little bit faster. We can scan left to right, until we see a one copying all zeros to the second tape as we go. And third, we can scan the ones crossing off a zero on the second tape. for each one. So now I have effectively, and then we'll accept reject, of course, depending on whether the numbers match. So this is another Turing machine, the two tape Turing machine for solving the same problem, but it does it a little bit differently. Um, we're gonna have a bunch of zeros on the tape, and a bunch of ones on the tape. And as we go left to right, we'll first copy our zeros to the second tape. And then as we read in the ones, we'll cross out ones and zeros and check to see if that number matches. This algorithm is a little faster 
So we already argued that our scanning for formatting step takes about n steps. Now I argue that our scanning left to right step, that takes O of n steps because I'm just going left to right, copying zeros to my second tape. And that this third step also takes O of n steps um, because now I'm scanning across the ones and I'm crossing out zeros as I cross out ones. Importantly, I don't have to shuttle back and forth every time I cross out a zero and a one. I can do these things at the same time, one pair of crossed out integers per step. So the total runtime of this algorithm is big O of n in total. Because of course, if I add up several functions that are big O of n, I can just um, show that uh, that the resulting function is big O of n just by scaling. So one takeaway you could take away from this multiple tapes don't increase the set of languages we can decide but they may increase how fast we can do it. And if you'd like a fun exercise where the answer to this exercise is in the textbook, um, you can try both to come up with a faster single tape algorithm for this problem. There is a faster single tape algorithm. I think the fastest one is big O of n log n. And you can also try to show that you can't do any better than big O of n log n. So right now we've said multiple tapes may be faster because we haven't strictly proved it. Uh, a priori, it seems possible that there could be some algorithm that runs in time big O of n on a single tape Turing machine, but it's going to turn out that that's actually impossible. We do get an advantage from a second tape in this case. That's kind of cool. That's our, our crash course in figuring out the time complexity of our algorithms on Turing machines. Um, we've seen the time complexity classes time of Tn. There's one, probably the most important time complexity class of all is this class called P, which stands for polynomial and we'll define p as follows so p is the class of languages that some deterministic tm decides in polynomial time. In math, we can write this in terms of the time complexity class we've just defined as P equals the union over all K of time n to the K. So in other words, if you can solve this problem in time big O of n to the K for any K, so it could be n, could be n squared, could be n cubed, could even be n to the 100, although algorithms that are that slow and still in P and that can't be improved are pretty rare. We'll call this polynomial time. So great, this is a well-defined class. Why do we care about this time class specifically? There's a, a lot of ways we could draw boundaries and come up with different time classes. Um, And there's a few intuitive reasons. One is the idea that polynomial functions are much, much smaller than exponential functions. So one thing this definition does is it separates all of the languages that can be decided in polynomial time 
from the languages that can't be decided in polynomial time, but can be decided in exponential time. So for example, like at n equals 1,000, which is a pretty reasonable input size for a computer, uh, n cubed is 1 billion, which is a pretty big number, but a number that a computer can handle. And 2 to the n is greater than the number of atoms in the universe. At small values, polynomials and exponential functions are comparable. But once you start looking at big input, there's really no comparison. Exponential functions grow like crazy. If there is one intuitive complexity fact to get into your brain, it's that polynomial good, exponential bad. Those four words, I mean, if you can internalize polynomial good, exponential bad, that'll get you through about the first half of complexity theory. It's an exaggeration, but very, very crucial idea here. Um, another idea is that polynomial times polynomial equals polynomial. So this means I can use polynomial functions as subroutines and stay in P. To give you an example, say, Problem A is decidable in time n to the C. So it's in the class P. And then problem B can be decided um, by can be decided if we can use A as a subroutine. So it can be decided by deciding A n to the D times. So the runtime for B is now big O of n to the D times n to the C. That is, we're going to run our program for problem A, our Turing machine for problem A, we're gonna run it n to the d times. That'll take us time n to the d times n to the c, which is just O of n to the c plus d. So it's convenient to treat all the problems solvable in polynomial time as one class, because that means we can use them as subroutines of each other, as long as we use the subroutine a polynomial number of times and we'll stay in the class. So. That convenient feature of the definition means that um, if we know a bunch of problems are in P, we can often get more problems that are in P. The third idea is that in practice, problems in P tend to have algorithms that run in small polynomials. So this is a very general statement, but essentially what it means is that the problems we're interested in, the problems in P, they don't tend to have run times. They don't tend to be solved by machines that run in time n to the 1000. Typically they run in time n or n squared or n cubed you know, maybe end of the fourth or fifth, but often if we really care about the problem and we can solve it in time end of the 10th, we can find a smarter way to boil it down and solve it in time end of the third. So this is not always true. This is just something that seems to be true in practice, but what it means often is that these problems are relatively small polynomials. So those are three reasons why we might want to define this class P and why you might think this class P is useful and less arbitrary than just any other time class you might come up with.
Um, I want to quote Sipser to support this last idea. He says, all reasonable, <laughs> we'll come back to that word, all reasonable, deterministic, computational models are polynomially equivalent. So reasonable means just about everything we use in practice. So for example, computers and Turing machines can simulate each other with at most a polynomial time slowdown. So what that means is like, if I can write a Turing machine that solves a problem in time end to the 10th, then my laptop can probably solve that problem in time end to the 11th. If, I can, if my laptop can solve that problem in time end cubed in some measurement frame, then my Turing machine can probably solve it in time end to the fifth. So essentially, that means if a problem is in P, in other words, if it's solvable in polynomial time on a Turing machine, it's poly time solvable on all computers. So this takes our notion of efficiency from efficiency in one very limited specific context this model of a Turing machine, and let's us say, well, I prove this problem's in P. That means not only that I can solve it in polynomial time on my Turing machine, but I can solve it in polynomial time on my laptop and your laptop and on this supercomputer. Uh, it lets us really make general statements about problems that can and can't be computed. So you could call this if you wanted to model independence. Meaning, do this problem on any model, any reasonable model, uh, it'll take you polynomial time. But yeah. Big takeaway, I'm writing it in slightly larger letters than the takeaway above. We can think of P as the class of efficiently decidable languages. It's all those languages that Turing machines can decide in polynomial time, which, you know, for simplicity, we're going to call all the language that can be decided, all the languages that can be decided efficiently. Um, we've drawn this arbitrary boundary, and of course, on the other side of it are languages that cannot be decided in polynomial time. We'll call those inefficient languages. So that's why P is such an important concept in computer science. We think of it as just the class of all the problems that we can solve efficiently on basically any computer. So some example problems in P. I mean, anything that's efficiently solvable. Um, so all the context-free languages can be decided in polynomial time. Problems like path is the input of a directed graph. I'll say, does the input of a certain direct graph contain a path 
between given vertices S and T. So might have some big old graph, but I can efficiently figure out if there's a way to get from S to T. The problem of deciding if two numbers are relatively prime, you know, given X and Y are X and Y relatively prime. These are just a few examples that come up in Sipser. So he proves that all of these languages can be decided in polynomial time, but there are many, 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 many others in every computational problem that we can solve efficiently. Every decision problem, that is, can be framed as a problem in P. So that's P. That's this first class that it's good to know about. Next, I want to tell you about NP, which stands for non-deterministic polynomial time. Another very important complexity class. And rather than the time it takes to solve the problem, NP, we're gonna think about the time it takes to verify that some solution to the problem is correct. It's not immediately clear how we do that for languages. Um, but essentially, we're going to want there to exist some certificate that you can show me to prove that a string is in my language. So the idea is that a problem is verifiable if you can show me some certificate, that is, some convincing evidence that proves a given string is in the language. This is different from being able to easily decide any given string. It might be hard to figure out if a string is in the language. It just means that there's some proof out there somewhere that you could show me to quickly convince me that the string was in the language. So, you know, a quick example of a problem that can be verified. A problem that gets talked about a lot in theoretical computer science is this problem called ham path, Hamiltonian path that takes in a graph and two vertices. And like a path, it's gonna to try to find a path from S to T. But in particular, we'll look for a path which satisfies a certain property. A Hamiltonian path, a path that passes through every vertex exactly once from S to T. So if this is my graph, then an example of a Hamiltonian path might be this blue zigzag, go through every vertex exactly once. So if we look at this, finding such a path is hard. Uh, I'm not gonna prove that, but I'll steal it. It's tricky given S and T in a general graph to write a Turing machine that finds a path between S and T, but showing a path is easy if we can find it. 
In other words, this is a problem that's hard to solve in the sense that it's hard to find a Hamiltonian path and say, okay, yes, this graph has a Hamiltonian path from G from S to T and it's in the language, but it's easy to verify. So for every yes input, there is some Hamiltonian path. And if you show that to me, it's pretty easy for me to tell, does this path go through every vertex? Does it do it exactly once? So this um, should be our example of why verification seems easier than um, decision. That's our intuition going into this. We can make this formal by defining a verifier. So we'll say a verifier for a language A is an algorithm V, where the language A is equal to all strings W, such that the verifier accepts W comma C for some certificate C. So this maps to this idea of verification that we've just seen. It's saying every string in this language, like every graph that might have a Hamiltonian path, um, the verifier is gonna do something like check and see if the path is indeed a Hamiltonian path. And what that'll mean precisely is that there's some certificate C, in this case, the path that proves that the instance is in the language. So B is a polynomial time verifier. If it runs in time polynomial in the length of W. Now we can define NP. So NP is the class of efficiently verifiable languages. That is all languages that have polynomial time verifiers. So what did we just say? What the heck is this complexity class? Well, zooming out, right? NP is a complexity class, which means it's a bunch of languages and it's defined by how easy those languages are to decide. Um, but instead of focusing on decision directly, we're gonna focus on languages that are efficiently, efficiently verifiable. That is, for every string in the language, there's some other string, some certificate that can prove to us efficiently, prove to some efficient algorithm that the string is in the language. So we'll lean on a hand path and we'll show some more examples. Uh, but really this makes the most sense if we think of the input as being some Turing machine or some graph with some property and the certificate as something that proves like a path itself that the input has the property. So some examples of languages in NP. Um, how about Sudoku? So this will be the language of all inputs P such that P is a Sudoku puzzle. And P is solvable. So this is a well-defined language. And now we're getting off into, whoa, 
It's a decision problem, really? Is Sudoku a decision problem? Yeah, it's a decision problem. I haven't completely formalized it, but you can write down a decision problem that looks like this. So Sudoku is going to be the class of all solvable encoded Sudoku puzzles. And the certificate for any puzzle is a valid solution. In other words, I claim that for any puzzle in the language, there exists some valid solution, and there's an algorithm that can check and see if that solution is indeed valid, proves that the puzzle is solvable in polynomial time. To check if a certificate is valid, we just need to make sure it follows the rules of Sudoku. No duplicate numbers in any row or column or box. There's also many more obviously mathy problems in NP, like cake peak. K clique, which is all encoded graphs G, such that G has a complete subgraph of size K. And a complete subgraph is just a graph where every vertex is connected to every other vertex. And the certificate that G is indeed in clique, well, it's just the subgraph itself. Just show me the vertices and I'll check to make sure they're all connected. Um, subset sum. Well, that's an encoding of a set of numbers and a target such that S is a set of numbers with a subset It adds up to T. Here, the certificate is just the subset. So here what I've done is I hand my Turing machine some big old basket of numbers. There are many, many subsets of this basket. And my Turing machine has to decide, is there any subset that adds up to T? It seems like it might take a long time, but if I show a subset that I claim adds up to T, it's easy to check and see if I'm right. I just add up the numbers and see if they make T. This is a surprisingly interesting problem that I've done some research work on in the past. Um, and just kind of, by the way, as an aside, although we won't prove it, NP is also the reason it's called non-deterministic polynomial time. It's the class of all languages decidable by a non-deterministic TM. And we won't go into this, but the intuition for why a non-deterministic Turing machine can decide any language that has a polynomial time verifier is that we'll non-deterministically guess all the possible certificates and check to see if anyone shows us that our input string is in the language. So, we've got these two languages, sorry, these two classes, P and NP. P is all the languages that are efficiently decidable, that are decidable by some Turing machine in polynomial time. And NP is all the languages that are efficiently verifiable. That is, can be verified by some Turing machine in polynomial time, some algorithm in polynomial time. If you have um, some string in the language, there's some proof out there somewhere, even if you can't find it, that you could show to me and efficiently prove that something was in the language. Um, one thing that it's pretty easy to show is that a P, P is a subclass of NP. So a certificate for any string W in L where 
L is a language in P. Well, suppose you had some string W in a language and you had a Turing machine that decides whether or not that string is in the language quickly. Um, then I claim you've also got a certificate that W is in the language. Just show off the accepting computation. In other words, we take some Turing machine that decides the language L in polynomial time, which is exists by definition because this language is in P, and we just show off its accepting computation, all the steps that it takes, which has at most polynomial length. That's a certificate. So P is a subset of NP. Converse question though is a lot harder. Is NP a subclass of P? Well, it seems unlikely. Um, does being able to efficiently certify a solution imply that you can efficiently find one? It seems kind of unlikely. Like think about our Sudoku, our Sudoku example. Um, it's pretty easy to show off a solution once you've found one, but being able to show off that solution certainly doesn't seem to give you any way of solving the problem. Solving the problem seems a lot harder. And indeed, it's conjectured that NP is not a subclass of P that there are problems that you can efficiently certify, but you can't efficiently solve. Um, and if this was not true, it'd be very surprising. It would mean any problem that we can efficiently verify, that we can look at a solution and say, yeah, that solution works, would guarantee us a way to find that solution. Um, but as maybe you've guessed, we don't know. Uh, this problem has grown up with complexity theory and become probably the biggest open problem in theoretical computer science. One of the biggest open problems in all of mathematics or science. I think there's a prize. If you can prove whether or not P equals NP, you can go claim a million dollars. So I highly encourage you guys to do that. Maybe take a break from the final and solve this question. Retire from Columbia, quit the course split the money with me because I taught you about it. That would be great. You are welcome to do that. So now, if you go back, watch this lecture a couple of times, you can tell all your friends that you understand the P equals NP question. And that's one nice thing you can take away from this course. So we are now at the end of all our course content. I'll summarize quickly what we did just in words. So in this course, we did formal science on computers. So we built computational abstractions and we studied their properties and we hoped that studying their properties and proving things about them would help us learn about computation itself. Um, we introduced the formal concept of a language that is a set of strings and we talked about how languages can capture concepts like palindromes or primality or uh, legitimate English sentences. And then we defined automata, these boxes of math, these mathematical machines that recognized certain languages. Came up with the idea that um, automata with more power, like non-determinism or memory, or random access memory can recognize more complicated languages and they can do so more quickly. And that makes us think that the classes of languages recognized by simpler automata are somehow simpler 
concepts. They're simpler computationally. We hope that these are real statements about the world. Uh, we also learned that computation has limits. There are problems computers can't solve. We can't decide ATM. We can't decide the halting problem. And we are still working on testing the limits of computation. So uh, if you go further into this field, you can start thinking about quantum computers or time travel computers, black hole computers, much more speculative ideas of what might be computable and how quickly computers with incredible properties might solve hard problems. Um, if you're interested in going on beyond this course, I'd recommend as next steps, um, the course in CSOR 4231. This is introduction to algorithms. So this is techniques for solving many problems fast and efficiently. Comms uh, 4236 is complexity theory. So this is P, NP, and beyond. So how quickly can Turing machines solve problems with non-determinism? Uh, what about if they have random bits or quantum power? Uh, how about space or even access to oracles? That's what we'll do in complexity. And then another one you might be interested in is comms 4252, which is computational learning theory. So this is machine learning from a theoretical perspective. Uh, it asks questions like, how can we train computers to categorize things, which is sort of like recognizing a language. And it asks, what concepts can be efficiently learned by different computing models? And then of course, there are many other graduate courses beyond this. So if you jump into these, if you love this class, I encourage you to keep exploring this field because I personally find it fascinating. Uh, if you took this course for a major requirement and you hated it, I hope you got something out of it and it wasn't too painful. Uh, but if you loved it, come tell me that you loved it. We can talk about how to do more stuff in this field. So I want to end this course with a sincere thank you to all of you, even if you've only watched virtually and contributed to ed or courseworks. Uh, if you've come to class, if you've come to class virtually, uh, you've definitely made this class richer. You've thought a lot learned a lot. Um, and I'm grateful to get to share this particular experience with you guys. I also want you to feel free to contact me. So I'm not going to write my email address here, but you can find it on my webpage. Uh, you probably have it if you're in the course. So if I can help with something else, I don't know, grad school, future classes, advice, thoughts, um, ping me at any time, send me an email. I've got some mentorship bandwidth. Final reminders. Uh, homework six due on Monday. The final is on eight ten and eight eleven. And the readings that go along with this lecture. 5.1 on undecidability and reductions. And 7.1 through 7.3 on time complexity. So thank you so much. Hope to see you in the future. Have a good one.